Thanks, Lisa, for that kind introduction. As Lisa said, this is um, the last session of today's special event. Um, in this session, we will discuss good practices and lessons learned from fighting environmental corruption. My name is Martina Erne. I'm a senior intelligence analyst with the Environmental Investigation Agency, which is a, a UK-based NGO. I'm delighted to be joined by these four speakers who will share their knowledge and experience with us. Um, so the speakers are Alexander Novikov, um, the head of the National Agency for Corruption Prevention in the Ukraine. Welcome, Alexander. Um, Johanny Grossman, a team leader of the Green Corruption Program at the Basel Institute on Governance. Corina Gilfillen. Oh, that's the wrong, wrong order. Um, Alex Haberschen, uh, Program Manager and Global Lead for Anti-Corruption in the Govern Governance Global Practice of the World Bank, and Corinna Gilfillen, Senior Analyst with the UNCAC Coalition. As for the format of this session, um, Brooke has uh, set the standard very high with her Kahoot quiz. We, we, we don't have a quiz, unfortunately. Um, but we will have a short presentation from each speaker and, and um, after that we will do a Q&A session. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the panelists who will share with us some examples of good practices in applying anti-corruption tools to combat environmental crimes from their national or organizational perspective. And, um, Alexander, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues. Uh, it's a, a pleasure for me uh, to be invited by uh, Basel Institute for this panel and uh, to be here one of the speakers. Uh, uh, this kind of corruption uh, was very spread in Ukraine too, uh, and uh, we have an experience how to uh, to work with these issues. And uh, it's a part of our anti-corruption strategy to divide the functions uh, of uh, uh, different institutions and uh, what we need uh, to do to, to do to do together with Yehani in Ukraine to uh, unbind in, uh, uh, to to make unbound in, uh, in our uh, forest management, and we do it in our uh, energy sector. And now we are uh, very successful, and we are uh, almost independent. Uh, uh, in our energy sector from uh, uh, other countries because of we uh, have worked together uh, with uh, our partners on the level of uh, um, ma management uh, uh, in this sphere. Uh, why, uh, why it is so important, especially now for Ukraine, corruption in the environmental, in, in environmental sphere? Because uh, in the uh, war with Russia, our nature helps us, our forests helps us but uh, so it uh, can defend uh, us uh, as a uh, nation but uh, our nature can defend us uh, as one of the part of the nature if we will keep uh, it um, uh, keep it alive that's why it's uh, very uh, corruption uh, undermines uh, uh, our ability to be sustained in any sphere and in this sphere uh, corruption can uh, lead us to the uh, situation when it was no conditions, will be no conditions to live on our planet. That's why it's super important for every country and for all humankind. Uh, now I want to shift our focus uh, to a powerful methodology that can drive positive change in our environmental as efforts. It's objects and key result method methodology that we implemented in our uh, govern uh, governance in Ukraine. And uh, we have prepared a guide for top managers, managers how, to, um, how to establish clear goals uh, in uh, this uh, part of discussion or in other uh, kind of governments. Uh, uh, OKR provide a raw roadmap how to clearly define our objects, for example, to um, to get in, to keep our forests um, alive and to, to spread them, uh, how to establish measurable key results and how to track our uh, our pro progress. Uh, by adopting uh, OKR methodology, we enhance our ability to address environmental challenges with pre precision and efficiency. Moreover, colleagues, 
why I am uh, mentioning it uh, during this panel. Stanford University uh, opened a new center uh, for the last seven, 70 years uh, in 2022, first time after 70 years. It's uh, John Doerr's uh, Center of Sustainability. I, know, I think that uh, every one of you, if you are working with uh, about the issues of uh, on the issues of sustainability, knows this center. Uh, he invested 1.1 billion of dollars of uh, his money to the Center of Sustainability. That, that uh, sustainability that uh, has aim to uh, for sustainable uh, development and uh, to keep climate change uh, to keep uh, our planet from uh, climate changes. Uh, you you can uh, take this uh, methodology that we develop for every top manager in the country, not only for Ukraine, and uh, you can scan it by scan uh, QR code. And uh, uh, only uh, if we have a clear vision of our goals, we understand how to measure it. We uh, can keep our, uh, our organizations and uh, management of natural resources on a high level because corruption is the result of bad management. So we need to manage our organizations and our goals, uh, goals of our governments better. And here is a clear roadmap how to do it. Thanks, Alexander. That was really interesting. Um, I would like, now like to hand over to Yuhani, please. Thank you very much. Um, tough act to follow. Going after Alexander, always something that's uh, unenviable. Um, but I, I wanted to thank you, Alexander, for joining the panel and uh, highlighting this uh, advanced, complex issue at a, such a difficult time uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and, and indeed, the forests help protect us. I think that was a great a great way to put it. Uh, I wanted to pivot a little bit because we were talking about complex issues. And so Alexander beautifully highlighted the prevention element uh, of environmental corruption and the lessons learned in this space. Uh, and I wanted to focus a little bit on the enforcement side of things, always the, the carrot and stick, right, in our business. Uh, and uh, and we've, um, in anticipation of the cost, we've put together a, a small uh, paper, or I should we I should say I had very little to do with it. Actually, it was my brilliant colleague Amanda and Sophie, uh, and there's no more hard copies available, but there are online copies available if you want to see it. And, and the paper uh, highlights the progress. It highlights the activities that countries are taking um, to address environmental corruption, um, taking the frame of the four years since the COSP resolution on environmental corruption. Uh, of course, it talks about prevention as well, but here I'll focus on the enforcement part. Uh, and what we are seeing, and of course we're doing this work from a, a basis of having a significant experience in providing enforcement assistance in the anti-corruption sector uh, and for the last three years in the green corruption sector specifically. Uh, and what we're seeing is that the uh, types of enforcement actions that countries are taken are quite varied actually and so our assistance of course has to also reflect that um, we see in some countries that law enforcement uh, is using anti-corruption tools uh, and applying them to the environmental sector so we're looking at for example bribery money laundering fraud tax evasion and that can be can be very effective of course when the the subject of the anti-corruption enforcement action um, relates to natural resources and then we see the flip side of that as well right we see natural resource agencies who have enforcement functions either investigative or sometimes prosecutorial as well um, who are uh, adjusting their approaches from enforcement that is primarily focused on uh, crimes of uh, who controls the natural resource, perhaps illicitly or smuggling in some cases, towards financial crimes. And that's, in our experience, a far different, far more difficult shift. Um, because those natural resource agencies don't 
do financial investigations as their day job. This is brand new to them. Uh, and then last but not least, given the, the significant presence of civil society and the role that civil society plays in this, there are of course also jurisdictions where private prosecutions uh, or I don't know uh, if there is such a thing, but PPP prosecutions uh, are taking place. Um, and that has also been quite, quite successful in a number of jurisdictions. Um, and all three of these approaches are being tested quite, quite heavily uh, in the last few years. Um, financial investigations and, and money laundering uh, legislation is being used, uh, of course, to address the relationship between corruption and, and environmental crimes. Uh, and what we've learned in this space, talking about lessons learned and, and looking forward, is that these take a long time. Uh, and uh, they usually take more, longer time than your typical donor grant. So this is a significant challenge for those of us trying to provide support to these kind of investigations and prosecutions. Uh, and I would dare say also something that donors might want to keep in mind um, as if they were willing to support this space, which I certainly hope they are. Um, the other um, the other element, uh, of course, here is that um, we have to be realistic about the role that different natural resource agencies play in this space. I think when we first, uh, we, I'm talking about my, my team here, but I imagine others had the same experience. When we first started this process, there was this enthusiasm that all the sophisticated anti-corruption, follow the money, uh, asset recovery, illicit enrichment tools that exist, we can just plop them into the natural resource space and they will naturally adopt themselves. Uh, and I think our understanding has become significantly more granular in this space. Um, of course, there are, there are agencies and institutions that have sufficient interest and, and will to adopt those kind of uh, sophisticated uh, follow the money tools. Uh, but there are also others where that's not going to be the case. And here, uh, there are still significant roles for them to play because they often are the first responders in cases. Uh, and what we've seen time and time again is that, for example, digital evidence or financial evidence is mishandled because the focus is on the natural resource, you know, the ivory or, or the timber or whatever the seizure may involve. Uh, and there isn't, um, there isn't the sort of uh, focus on ensuring that the financial evidence is also safeguarded. I think I'm coming to the end of my time. Um, so uh, I'll just make uh, one quick more point, uh, which is that uh, one thing that we've been a little bit surprised uh, to see be effective, because I'm naturally skeptical about these sorts of things, uh, are multi-agency task forces. I think they're really uh, quite a prerequisite, actually, for creating the space uh, that allows uh, agencies who don't typically engage, either from the anti-corruption side, who don't typically work on natural resources, or the other way around. And having this multi-stakeholder platform and these uh, discussions allow for a space for collaboration that is really a prerequisite for bringing cases over the line. So uh, I'll just stop here and save the rest for the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Johanny, for um, highlighting the importance of uh, financial investigations. And I would also recommend everyone to read the report um, mentioned uh, by Yuhani. Um, Alex, would you like to go next, please? Thank you very much, and thank you to Basel for organizing and for inviting the World Bank to join the panel and to the Environmental Investigation Agency as well. Um, I will speak very briefly about some of the lessons we've learned at the World Bank about fighting corruption and environmental crime from a law enforcement perspective and then say a few words about work that we've only recently begun to identify the drivers of corruption in the response to climate change um, from a governance perspective. So a much, much broader lens and, and set of challenges. On the environmental crime and law enforcement perspective, uh, we have a financial integrity team at the World Bank who address the problem of environmental crime from an anti-money laundering focus, which we've, we've heard already. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to stealing your last hard copy there, Diani, of the, of the guide. Um, I want to highlight four lessons learned from the work at the World Bank, and I'm sure they're already in that guide, but I'm just going to be really, no, I, I really will take it. We'll give it back. We'll give it back. Um, <laughs> so uh, four lessons learned, which are really recommendations for action um, in fighting environmental crime if you're, if you're in the anti-money anti -money laundering uh, area of work. So 
the links between environmental crime and money laundering need to be better understood and better leveraged. There are potentially really missed opportunities here uh, for law enforcement. Um, people are profiting off environmental crime and they're using traditional money laundering instruments in order, in order to profit. Um, so to do that, we need, we need to define the typologies of risk and, and disseminate these across the law enforcement community. Um, the second recommendation is, you know, if it's about following the money, this work needs to employ a whole of government approach to environmental crime. So that means, and I think echoing what you have just said, the interagency approach, tax administration, customs, financial intelligence units, or reporting entities need to be part of the fight. Um, there's also a need to expand the criminalization of environmental crime as a predicate offense for money laundering prosecutions. So some jurisdictions have done that, but everything that we've just been describing is going to be difficult to achieve without, without the criminalization. The abuse of anonymous corporate vehicles is part of the problem as well, of course, and this ties in with the tremendous amount of progress that is happening on beneficial ownership transparency and needs to be connected with the environmental crime work. Fourth, and Yohani mentioned this as well, there is also work to be done to sensitize the private sector um, so that they can better identify operations that might be related to activities that degrade the environment. When we talk about the links between corruption and environmental crime, the formula is, is the same as it is with other kinds of crime. Corruption exacerbates the problem, it enables it, and it undermines our response to it. When we think about the links between corruption and the response to climate change, the issue is broader and significantly more complex. Uh, we also have less experience and knowledge on the subject. So we urgently need to advance our understanding of the risks and collectively start shaping policy responses to it. Um, we heard on Monday in this room, in the first climate panel, a call to action for the anti-corruption community to get engaged in the response to climate change. And we also need to ensure that the climate and anti-corruption communities are speaking to each other. Um, this has been a theme actually in other panels here on other sectors, um, something for us all to, to think about. Last week at COP28, uh, the World Bank joined with the IMF in co-hosting a session on addressing the governance and corruption risks in the response to climate change. We were joined in that session by the Auditor General of South Africa, by the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, the World Resources Institute, and the Natural Resource Governance Institute. Takeaway from that session, and there are many, but I'll just emphasize one, is that we need to scale up the government functions and non-governmental initiatives that are already having an impact in providing accountability in the sectors and industries in this space and extractives. We have a lot that is already happening and already working and we need to build on it. Equally on the accountability side, Supreme Audit institutions are already playing an important role. Um, the World Bank is supporting the independence of Supreme Audit institutions uh, and the important role that they are beginning to play and will continue to play in sustainability reporting. Um, so best practices there is something that we need to share. We're also seeing some important work being done to build social accountability. Uh, and this is arguably where some of the strongest voices are being heard. Um, and the Global Partnership for Social Accountability at the World Bank is supporting uh, community-led social accountability structures, working with initiatives like the World Resources Institute. We have a lot to learn still, um, together with UNODC and uh, in preparation for the COSP, uh, we've prepared a discussion note for the conference. There is a there is a QR code, um, and I think it's up there on the screen now. Um, this note uh, begins to set out what we see as some of the drivers of corruption risk in the response to climate change, and it includes some initial recommendations. Um, so those who work in the anti-corruption community, we all understand instinctively that an increase in the volume of financing in the response to climate change is going to multiply the corruption risks, um, whether it's financing for adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage funds. But the challenge is larger than, the, than an increase in financing. Um, the answer isn't simply for us to do more of the same. And we also don't have the luxury or the time or the means to accelerate the creation or strengthening of institutions. Uh, we hear it said often it takes decades to build institutions. So we need to be thinking creatively and proactively about what works now, what do we need to scale up? and where do we need to focus resources if we need to do something new to address risks associated with new financing instruments, unregulated carbon markets, the new industries and the subsidies that support them. They all introduce new kinds of corruption vulnerabilities and the new regulations and the opportunity to distort regulations um, 
could potentially undermine our response to climate change as well as generate uh, corrupt uh, opportunities. Um, the note emphasizes the potential risk also to exacerbate existing inequities between high and low income countries um, insofar as climate change impacts and the impacts of corruption. Um, I'm going to stop there for now and happy to, happy to come back on, on any of those points. Thanks, Alex, for your input. Um, again, I would encourage everyone to read the report um, that was just up, up on the screen. Um, and also thanks, Alex, for highlighting um, the issue um, or the importance of social accountability. And now over to you, Corinna. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Basel Institute and to Environmental Investigation Agency for um, organizing this session. Uh, today I'm speaking on behalf of the UNCAC Coalition's Working Group on Environmental Crime and Corruption. We have more than 180 participants from civil society organizations and academia from across the globe, and we're advocating for strong actions to prevent and fight the corruption that enables environmental crime as well as other environmental harms. And we have a particular focus, since we're the UNCAC coalition, of uh, using, looking at bolstering the UNCAC basically to address this important issue. Today I'm gonna speak about, uh, no, I wouldn't say good practices, I would say essential practices for protecting and promoting civil society in efforts to combat com corruption related to the environment. And just a little bit about the challenges um, we know that land, environmental and indigenous leaders and defenders, civil society organizations, local communities, whistleblowers and journalists all play a crucial role in exposing and combating environmental crime and corruption and bringing attention to the problem. And across the globe, they're facing significant threats, attacks and killings in carrying out their work, often in a culture of impunity. For Global Witness, they've started reporting on the killings of land and environmental defenders in 2012. And since then, 1,733 defenders have been killed trying to protect their land and resources. And as we know, corruption is many times linked, you know, in, in, in you know, part of that, that problem. That's an average of one defender killed approximately every two days over 10 years. So consistent with the Article 13 of the UNCAC, states must provide a safe and enabling environment for those who uncover and report corruption harming the environment. And so I wanted to, it's hard in five minutes to do this justice, but I wanted to just highlight um, some ways in which, in what governments should be doing and provide some examples of what's been done and what civil society has been done as well. Um, and first, and on a basic uh, level, it's crucial to ensure there are adequate legal frameworks in place that are effectively enforced to protect and promote civil society engagement in this issue. Um, and we see, if you talk to the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, we see that there's um, a lot of laws passed across the globe that are harming NGOs, um, making it very difficult for them to operate. Um, so we need laws regulating the NGO sector that enable organizations to operate freely and without governmental in interference. Um, we also know that in the environmental sector, we've heard a lot about um, challenges with um, land grabbing, for example, we, we have a lot of uh, challenges. And so one of the things we don't see as much as we need to is for companies to be required to proactively consult with and consider the views of communities, indigenous peoples um, through free prior informed consent. So that's a, a very important project. If you look at, or, or, or policy, if you look at um, monitoring that Global Witness and other groups have done, it's very challenging, but there are some victories. Um, NGOs reach, you know, are victorious kind of in, in opposing projects or um, basically, you know, protecting their territory uh, through campaigning, but also through the courts, you know, through, through a legal process. It's often very protracted. Um, another thing I'd like to, to really focus on is the importance of a government's legally requiring and effectively implementing strong protection and reward mechanisms for whistleblowers for both the public and the private sector who report on environmental crimes and corruption. Um, and what we're finding is that NGOs, I think, are playing a really important role um, in trying to promote this. And I wanted to 
cite as an example the National Whistleblower Center. They have a climate corruption uh, campaign, and it's focused specifically on the fossil fuel and the timber industries. And they're trying to educate potential whistleblowers in these sectors about their rights under whistleblower laws and also their right to keep their identities um, confidential. So NGOs have a role to play, but also governments need to set up these, these kind of uh, effective for protection and reward and uh, mechanisms. Um, another really important area is promoting the active implementation of non-governmental organizations. Something that you would think is, is pretty ba basic, but I think that uh, is, is uh, posing a challenge at uh, cost 10 um, as they're negotiating resolutions. So I would just say that this is a really important one and obviously not, not present in, in, in a lot of countries or a challenge in, in some countries. Um, and I just wanted to highlight and I, I'm sure you've all heard throughout the day, the really invaluable role that um, civil society is playing in, 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 a, in a range of different ways, both not just exposing the problem, but uh, actually investigating, uh, exposing, um, crim you're right, exposing crimes and um, you know, monitoring as well to make sure laws are effectively implemented. And I wanted to highlight the Wildlife Justice Commission, which works across the globe, but it's Operation Dragon, which exposed and disrupted the trafficking of net networks involved in the legal trade of turtles and tortoises in Southeast Asia. And that resulted in cooperation with law enforcement, and it led to arrests, convictions, and you know, helping those critically endangered species. So that's just one example. There's a lot of um, NGOs that are more and more doing that, that those types of uh, research and investigation. And also on the, um, in the timber sector, um, indigenous peoples, local community, communities, monitoring logging activities in their own communities um, and finding violations of, of the timber regulations. So playing a very important role um, at the community level. Just I wanted to, to kind of end with one other um, good practice that we've heard throughout the day, including in the previous panel, and that's the role of um, multi-stakeholder groups. And we've heard about EITI. Um, and I think that multi-stakeholder approach can be quite effective, but it really does need um, the buy-in and, and high-level commitment uh, of the government um, to really make that happen. And I wanted to cite, and as well as an enabling environment for civil society to really be able to freely and effectively participate in, in those kinds of, um, you know, uh, stake, uh, those, those kind of um, approaches. I think for EITI, one example that I wanted to cite is, because I think if you look at EITI country by country, some multi-stakeholder groups are very effective and others are not functioning as well. So it really does depend on the environment, the, the context. And one, one I think uh, good practice was in Ghana, where they really had um, not just the participation of government agencies, but the parliament, along with a wide range of civil society organizations. And they did a lot of high-level forums, not just high-level forums, but workshops. Um, and they really had a sustained kind of ongoing process. And through that, they came up with consensus that they needed a law to try to, cr to create a central beneficial ownership register. So it's nice when actually laws come out of uh, consensus versus uh, you know, having somebody go to the parliament and do it on their own, and then there being a lot of controversy, right? So when you can have that, it's uh, it's it's a good a good scenario. So that that's an example of um, where that process has led to something very important on uh, advancing beneficial ownership transparency, which is important for tackling environmental crime and corruption. Um, and finally, I just wanted to um, end by saying that. We're talking about Resolution 812, which was an important resolution, the first resolution that, that the, the UNCAC COSP adopted on this issue. And, you know, just to say that um, we're very uh, disappointed that there's not going to be a dedicated resolution to environmental crime and corruption at this meeting, despite 301 uh, civil society organizations and experts in 99 countries that have called for uh, greater action at the cost through a resolution. And I think that it's, it's, it's very disappointing. I think that it shows um, a lack of leadership by, by governments not to make these linkages as the COP is, is going on or just about to end now. Uh, actually, no, it's already ended, right? <laughs> um, so I just wanted to, to raise that because I think that we would like to call for governments to take more leadership in the UNCAC and making those connections and making those connections between the UNCAC, between the climate, all the, the work on the climate, the climate convention, um, you know, uh, UNEP, other things, making more of these connections to try to tackle the club climate crisis, which should be front and center 
for all of us. So I did want to, to end with that and also to encourage you to join the UNCAC coalition, the Working Group on Environmental Crime and Corruption, where we're going to take this forward over the next two years to make sure we have even stronger actions at the next cost. Thanks. Thanks, Corina, for sharing your insights and thanks everyone else for your presentations. We will now move on to the Q&A session, which I will kick off with a couple of questions. Um, so my first question for Johanny. Um, we've heard a lot about the different responses to environmental corruption. What opportunities do you see to scale up these responses in the future? Um, thank you, Martina. Um, I think the this well this question actually wasn't set up like that, but it works well. Uh, addresses the key challenge uh, that we found in our report is that there's lots of interesting activities that countries are doing, um, but this, their scale and, and their scope to some extent is not commensurate to the challenge that they're supposed to address. So there's a lot of uh, corruption related to the environment out there, and our responses are episodic and experimental still at this stage. We don't see a single country that we work in where there is sort of a systematic large scale uh, effort in this. Doesn't mean it can't be scaled, of course, uh, but it's very, very challenging, especially at a time of constrained resources. Um, and so th there are a few approaches that we're, we're trying to foster here, uh, by no means a, a finite list. Um, one is that um, we see from our partners, coming back to the law enforcement space for a second, we see from our partners that this is a very lonely business, right? Um, if you're in an anti-corruption agency and really, you really care about promoting cases related to the environment, there's not going to be many of you, most likely. And if you're in a natural resource agency, who, uh, if you're somebody who keeps talking about corruption, also, you're not going to have a lot of peers. Um, and so what we're trying to do is foster sort of international networks of these individuals, uh, uh, sometimes maybe a support group uh, in a way uh, of, um, of frustrated environmental corruption fighters and, um, and highlight to them the experiences that their peers are making, uh, especially where those are positive and we see a few cases that are that are coming to the cusp of maturity uh, right now actually um, and so the, the extent that we can inspire them and teach some lessons learned not just about sort of broad motivation but also specific techniques to use that's of course great um, the other element of course is that in this sort of transversal space all of us are a bit of a disadvantage right those of us who have an anti-corruption background like me we don't tend to know very much about the environment and the conservationists tend to um, also i dare say struggle with understanding the granularity of the anti-corruption space uh, and so the good news about this is that there is great uh, learning products out there, uh, and Martina is a moderator to this, so she can't plug her own products, but the EIA investigations, for example, are a very good place to start to understand um, the space much better. Um, and then the final, the final element in terms of scaling is, I think, sort of a, a forgotten space that we really don't talk about, even, even amongst ourselves, uh, is the role that state-owned enterprises play in this space. Um, and uh, um, I don't think I'll be too controversial to say that uh, state-owned enterprises in many countries are a significant hoard of corruption. Um, and of course, in many cases, the utilization of natural resources is managed by state-owned enterprises. And so to a large extent, that's sort of a perfect storm, uh, especially at a time when they corporate governance in the private sector is of course going into overdrive it seems like the gap between the state-owned enterprises is getting larger and larger so that's uh, i think a space where uh, if we're talking about scaling up our efforts we're relatively little and i'm saying relatively because it's still a lot of effort but relatively little effort can bring very significant impact because of the scale uh, that these state-owned enterprises operate at thank you Thanks, Johanny. And um, Alex, I would like to ask you the same question, please. Opportunities to scale up. Well, I, I mentioned in my remarks that something that needs to happen is that the anti-corruption and the climate communities need to be talking to each other. 
Um, and the other thing we need to do is to deepen our understanding of the drivers of corruption risk in the response to climate change and how we can shape policy responses to that. So um, on the back of this note, which was on the screen a little bit earlier that we have jointly prepared with UNODC, that begins to look at the drivers of corruption risk and make some initial recommendations, um, UNODC and World Bank have agreed to set up a, a working group, um, at least initially to get international organizations uh, coordinated on this. Um, we will also be looking for participation from expert uh, think tanks and from interested governments. So we know USAID is is already uh, joining the group. Uh, Basel, uh, thankfully, is also on board. Uh, and so is the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative. The idea is not to create a gigantic bureaucratic talking shop, seriously, honestly, um, but we, we need to find uh, effective ways of uh, coordinating our work amongst ourselves and getting that conversation happening with with the climate community. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. And my next question for Corinna. You've already um, touched upon the, the the vast topic of um, uh, the UNCAC COSP 19 resolution. In your view, what's the value of that resolution? And the second part of the question, how can CSOs encourage the implementation of, of, of that res resolution? Um, I think the resolutions uh, are important, resolution 812 and, and more broadly, because they set out commitments, you know, standards for governments to meet to tackle a specific issue. And that's what Resolu Resolution 812 does on a, on a variety of topics, whether it's corruption prevention or on the enforcement side. Um, and uh, in addition to that, it usually has mandates for UNODC to carry out very various, um, you know, projects and activities to promote the resolution, whether it's technical assistance or development of studies. Uh, convenings of, of things, tools, et cetera. And so, um, and hopefully doing that in, in consultation with um, other fora and with um, stakeholders, various stakeholders like civil society. Ideally, that's how it should be. Um, so I think that um, from those two, uh, from the commitment side and the actual follow-up, the implementation and the resolution, um, it's important. I think for civil society, it provides the resolution is one in, in this fora, and there's there's other many other foras that are coming out with with resolutions as well to use. But it's a way to hold governments to account to say, look, this was a commitment, and then there's implementation. What are you doing to 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 commit to it? And that's why I think that we're um, that we're very uh, supportive of having a follow-up resolution or some kind of other re resolution um, because it's been four years since this one has has was adopted and obviously things have have evolved and, and changed quite a bit since that time so um, but I think for civil society it is a very important um, you know tool for us you know as far as as far as um, what we're how we work with governments and how we promote uh, the follow-up so thanks Corinna and my last question for Alexander how do you think corruption risks relating to the enviro environment can be managed more effectively? First of all, we, we don't need to manage corruption risk in the environment. I mean separately. Uh, I give up one example of our joint, joint project of World Bank and uh, Ukraine, uh, where we updated a management system for our land uh, resources in uh, 2013, I think, and we created a IT tool, publicly available IT tool for uh, of our state cadastre, and uh, uh, it uh, reduced uh, corruption risks in 10 times. Ten times, just a good management and creation of very transparent IT tool for all lands in Ukraine. It's a huge uh, joint success of World Bank and Ukraine. Uh, then uh, it uh, it is able uh, now it is able for us to evaluate uh, all lands and uh, World Bank uh, even during the war helps uh, Ukraine to do it and uh, what we understand and what we find we find that. Uh, some part of the territory was, uh, of Ukraine was uh, uh, stole from the <laughs> state cadastra, and uh, it's a, a huge territory. It's a territory uh, like a territory of Lithuania. 
uh, that's why when we are uh, updating our management systems, uh, how we manage lands, forests, uh, water uh, resources, uh, we uh, increase the level of how we manage corruption risks. It's a main, um, it have to be a main goal for every one of us. We need to build uh, to build maturity of management systems in any organization. We need to put our management systems on a four measurable or five optimized level of uh, management. And uh, that is our approach in Ukraine and our agency. And I uh, once more promote and act now, promote uh, uh, object and key result methodology uh, and implementation of this methodology to every organization. And just one example, 60% uh, of top 20 companies in the world, including Apple, Google, Tesla, Microsoft, they are using uh, this uh, 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 this management methodology. If uh, we uh, proposed here how to understand on which level of integrity uh, is organization in uh, in any country, it's a word uh, methodology that can be implemented in any country. Uh, so take uh, take it and uh, move on the uh, on this uh, on nine steps with nine steps. Uh, in the process of building maturity of management in any organization. Thanks, Alexander. We're all we're all going to read the report. Um, I think there is time for one or two questions from the audience in the room, if there are any. Um, if so, please do raise your hand and uh, state your name, your organization, and uh, please keep your question short. Yes, please. Can you can you hear me? Okay, yes. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is Siri Nelson. I'm the executive director at National Whistleblower Center. So first, I just want to say thank you so much for the recognition, Karina. It's so moving, made my day. Um, but my question is, how can civil society do better to create pressure for resolutions that need to be passed to be passed? to combat environmental crime? And also, how can we put more pressure on our governments to improve their enforcement and also to take this um, type of crime more seriously? Karina, do you want to? I can take the first part. I think others can take the part on the enforcement, right? Um, but I think that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if there are government representatives in the room that have any ideas on that that they would want to share, but I think that um, for civil society, it's, it's, it's about coming and being able to um, effectively participate in UNCAC fora and be given, given access to UNCAC fora because there are a lot of challenges. You know, we can't go to the working group meetings. We can't participate in negotiations of resolutions. That makes it very challenging. Um, and so there are some, some particip participation, access to information challenges. But I think um, moving beyond that, because I think at this cost, we're doing as much as we can, you know, to overcome that. I think working at the um, country level, uh, you know, both to, to, you know, support effective implementation of the UNCAC and other, um, you know, other, other agreements to try and combat corruption linked to the environment is very important. And then uh, really building support within governments at the country level to support action both at the country level and then at the international level. So I think that that's something that we can build on. We had, you know, as I said, this open letter of uh, 301 organizations that signed on to our letter over a short period of time. There was a lot of like interest. So I think we need to build upon that um, for the future. So I would just say, if you want to join our working group and help uh, mobilize, uh, we have postcards on the table. So please go ahead and we hope you join us. Thank you. Uh, I want to add, uh, an hour ago we have a panel, uh, Ukrainian panel, uh, Ukrainian Integrity Ecosystem War and Ponds for Recovery. And there were two representatives of uh, government 
and four from civil society. It's Ukrainian approach. I think that we are the champions uh, in the involvement of uh, NGOs, and uh, it's a, a key to our res resilience even during the war. And uh, what is uh, my approach as the head of the National Agency on Corruption Prevention? I am uh, responsible for defining the methodology of uh, uh, corruption risk assessment and uh, corruption risk uh, ma uh, management. And we defined uh, two years ago a new methodology that uh, there, there, there have no be any risk assessment uh, without involvement uh, of NGOs. And now it's a, a usual practice uh, in Ukraine. Uh, another example, uh, we uh, created our anti-corruption strategy uh, with uh, uh, full involvement of all uh, NGOs who want to, uh, to take part in the uh, creation anti-corruption strategy. Moreover, and last one, uh, now we are in the process uh, of implementation anti-corruption strategy in the management of uh, natural resources too. And uh, it is uh, NGOs, Razum Proti Corruption, uh, 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 together against corruption, who are monitoring implementation of anti-corruption strategy. Uh, anti-corruption strategy have uh, an aim to, uh, the aim to set up all governance uh, for better management uh, environmental uh, issues. Um, maybe if I can just add, um, I think I spoke about this a little bit earlier. I think one of the challenges is that many of us are interested in this space, but you know, we conceptually think it's important to engage with the other side, if I can put it that way. Um, but we don't always know how to do that. Um, and so I think it creates a certain amount of discomfort, certainly coming from the anti-corruption space, you know, you always feel a little bit inadequate in terms of your knowledge about important conservation issues. And again, I dare say our colleagues on the other side maybe feel the same sometimes. Um, and so one, one of the approaches we've taken to, to address that is to create sort of an open space that brings together um, civil society, government, journalists, academia who want to work in this space. Uh, this was created together um, with Traffic, uh, WWF and Transparency International and it's called the Countering Environmental Corruption Practitioners Forum. Uh, and there's a number of sub-working groups on specialized topics such as land and data and following the money uh, and I'm sure there will be more. Uh, and so I encourage those of you who are keen to engage uh, to participate, but also those of you who have a specific issue that they want to test and engage, maybe such as whistleblowing, for example, in this space, to, to participate actively and create your own working groups in this space. Because I think one thing that's very obvious is that we're really only at the very beginning of understanding how these various tools can work together. Um, and uh, a lot of more effort is required to gain a more granular, more detailed, and thus more effective understanding for our implementation. Thank you. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question, a very, very quick one. Yes, please, Rafael. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rafael Edu, Environmental Investigation Agency. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, Fighting corruption can vary depending on the political context in place. Uh, if we forgot that, our, strat our strategy may not work. Uh, and we need to uh, consider some point like in a democratic system, civil society rule is well respected. Uh, because they have voice, people will understand what they are defending. It will have impact on the election. So people care about <laughs> the election, so politicians they can listen to. Second, in a non-democratic system, the leader, they don't care about the population. They don't care about civil society. So that's why if some people, they are talking, they are speaking out, they found a way to kill them or to arrest them. So I think we need a different approach in non-developing, in non-democratic country or 
even in some country they are democratic, but the institution the institution are weak. When the institution are weak, there is a, another problem. So we need to consider all of that and build on the commitment of key people uh, who are willing to make change. Starting working from them and go further will be the best way. Otherwise, we will be doing a lot of training, reform. They will adopt all the law, all the power at the end of the day. We don't see any impact. Thank you. I will answer. Uh, we uh, had the situation that you mentioned uh, in Ukraine before uh, 2014, when where, uh, when President uh, worked only on this pocket and uh, pockets of his uh, allies. And uh, we uh, work uh, building uh, trust to uh, to civil uh, to uh, non-government organizations. And uh, then, when our president uh, refused uh, even uh, uh, to move country to uh, to the European Union, to the values of uh, freedom, democracy, rule of law. Uh, as you know, we uh, fight for freedom or to, in the revolution and dignity and change even our president. And now he is in Russia. He escaped in Russia. Uh, so uh, it's, it's only 10 years ago. And for today, we have absolutely different country. I just give you two numbers. In Yanukovych time, we had 60% of uh, corrupt practices in our society. It was a skeleton uh, of Soviet Union and now a skeleton of Russia and was a skeleton of Ukraine during Yanukovych uh, time. Corruption was a skeleton. But now the level of corrupt practices is uh, only 17%. Just imagine this cultural and practical shift. So there is a way how to move forward to integrity. Thanks, Alexander. I'm afraid our time's up. Um, so we need to conclude this session. I would like to thank the panelists for sharing their wisdom and insights. Uh, so can we please give a round of applause to the panelists? And I would also like to thank the people and organizations um, that helped facilitate this event, uh, the UNODC, the UNCA coalition, and of course, the Basel Institute. Thank you very much. And I now hand over to Maria for closing remarks. Thank you, everybody. Um, it really has been an incredible day i think the discussions have been of course to some extent concerning but also um inspiring and and hopeful so i think it is really good good to take take things from here um there's a lot to to ha let sink in now so i think we all need some time to reflect and and ponder of everything what has been said but then it is a really good place to start the next year with new enthusiasm and, and energy and drive and, and also new cooperation and collaboration and, and partnership. So um, I think it remains to me to say uh, a huge thank to all co-organizers. Again, um, it was a joint um, effort of, of 11 countries, three coalitions, 10 CSOs, and uh, and two intergovernmental organizations so so it has been uh, quite quite um not easiest <laughs> thing to do but we have managed and i think we managed it better so thank you for all, everybody for your cooperation thank you for 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 you for listening also online and and really let's let's try to try, try to things take things forward and and implement what we have discussed here Lastly, I just would like to have like like to ask all the all the organizers and all the uh, panelists and speakers who are here to stay here for a little moment to take one picture to remind our collaboration. So thank you, everybody. It has been really a pleasure.